here on the Gulf Coast, communities know they're the front line of sea level rise. We're seeing more water. We're seeing more frequent storms. We're seeing the ferocity of storms increase. We're seeing like rainfall dumps. We have to make people knowledgeable, get them engaged. We can't just sit back and allow those changes to happen. We want to be in the best shape to adapt. There's a lot of things we can do, and we ought to do, to make ourselves protected and more resilient and to live with a changing climate. Uh, my name is Logan Benedict of Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I am joined today by Kim Holland, the Assistant Secretary of Strategic Development from the Florida Department of Transportation. Jennifer Hecker, the Executive Director of the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership, as well as Frank Martz, who is the City Manager for the City of Altamont Springs. And uh, we're here to talk about economic resiliency and ecological resili resiliency really being the same thing um, and pairing well together. But um, we're going to go through this. I'm going to introduce myself. There will be time for uh, our panelists to talk more about themselves and their programs. And then we're going to go through some questions and discussions for all of you. But um, before we get started in all of that, I wanted to do a little bit of getting to know the audience. Real simple, you guys don't have to shout anything out. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to raise your hand, audience or stage members alike, if you were born in Florida. So go ahead, raise your hands if you were born in Florida. You guys, born in Florida. Uh, and then, so hands down, great. I also wanted to give everybody who is not born in Florida the chance to raise your hands. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a few of us. It's almost half and half here. Um, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about people moving to the state, but I, it's not trying to divide the room, just to point out the fact that we are all here for the same reason we all care about Florida and the future of Florida, no matter where we came from uh, before we got to the state and to this room today. So thank you for that. Um, give yourself a round of applause real quick for caring, first of all, and being here. So. Um, but now I want a chance for you guys to get to know our panelists up here. Uh, so Kim, let's go ahead and start with you. Logan, I really love that first question, and I am super proud to be a Florida native. I actually just learned I'm a ninth generation which makes me super proud. Uh, my family, we've actually raised five daughters here in the state of Florida, and I really enjoyed watching the video after lunch and, and looking at all the trails. If you came to my house, you'd see a lot of bikes hanging in my garage. <laughs> but uh, I'm so proud to be here and be representing the Florida Department of Transportation. I'm a professional engineer, but I'm also a certified floodplain manager, and I'm also lead accredited. Jennifer. 
Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I represent the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership, which I know is a mouthful. We lovingly refer to it as just CHNEP, and it's part of the US EPA National Estuary Program. There are 28 national estuary programs in the United States and four in Florida. The one that I represent represents Florida's Heartland and Southwest Florida, thus the name Coastal and Heartland. And we are really comprised of local, state, and federal governmental entities who are working to protect our natural resources, as well as NGOs who participate in our partnership. So it's uh, a very uh, diverse group of entities from all levels of government coming together to protect our water and wildlife. And we cover 10 counties and 28 cities. So it's, it's a large area. Uh, that we are working to protect. Thank you. Frank. Thank you very much for having me. I'm a throw in today. Um, the other panelist was unable to make it and I and, uh, was asked to join. Uh, but I really enjoy uh, being in front of people, especially people who care about the environment the way that you do. I'm the city manager for the city of Altamont Springs, and if you don't know where Altamont is, it's just north of Orlando. Um, but it's a very unique place. We run very much like a business. Um, we are a completely debt-free city. Um, we haven't raised taxes in a decade. Um, and we have diversified our revenue such that oh, about 15% of our revenue comes from property taxes. So we have diversified very much like businesses do uh, in order to survive and adapt. We are crazy innovative. We have uh, 13 pilots going on with the state right now. We are part of the White House um, national readiness protocols. We helped build the national wastewater uh, surveillance system and developed one of the first COVID uh, models that could take RNA out of sewage and predict where there would be outbreaks of COVID. But we do a lot of other stuff, a lot of in environmental innovation. Uh, we are mounting or standing up and going vertical with an uh, Altamont, what we call the Altamont Global Innovation Lab. Um, with uh, several Fortune 25 and for Fortune 50 companies. And what we will do, particularly uh, partnering with um, Secretary Hamilton at the DEP, the folks at St. John's, and the Florida Department of Transportation, start bringing people into Altamont to see some of the innovation. Um, not a lot of people know where Altamont is. Uh, I think in about seven months, PBS is going to be running a story on the best city you've never heard of. And um, we're very excited. Uh, if you know who Dennis Quaid is, he's coming to do the interview. So it should be kind of fun. That's who we are. Great. Thank you all. Um, and then, of course, I want to introduce myself, Logan Benedict, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. I'm the Adaptation and Landscape Specialist. So I get to spend my time thinking about climate adaptation and resiliency, um, as well as how we all fit together. That, that landscape scale perspective from uplands all the way to ocean. So it's a privilege to have that role. And I'm sure at some point, all of you in this room have interacted with someone from Florida Fish and Wildlife. There's plenty of us in the room today and have been part of this conference, but we are responsible for managing fish and wildlife in the state, as well as some of that managed land you guys have seen on maps. We have a great WMA system in the state. There's 6 million acres. And uh, about 1.5 million of that is primary ownership or lead by Florida Fish and Wildlife. Um, and thanks to great programs like the Florida Forever program and our partners at DEP, that continues to grow. We added 13,000, uh, just under 13,000 acres of land to our WMA systems just in this last year. So um, yeah, great to be here. And I'm. Uh, I'll be leading this session, and I think we can go ahead and, and get into some of the questions and, and discussion for all of you. Um, the first thing I wanted to get into is to acknowledge the fact that we're sitting in this room today. It, we're just one day shy of when Ian impacted us just a year ago, Hurricane Ian. And so I wanted a chance for all of you to talk about some of the response that came out of that. Um, some of the lessons learned and, and some of the things you've had to think about as a result of the impacts of that storm. Uh, and absolutely feel free to bring up the combination of our 
gray infrastructure, the built environment, as well as the natural environment and how they tie together. So, Kim, you'd like and to go. I'll, or Logan, I'll kick it off. Um, what was so intriguing about preparing for this panel is the different types of responses that each of us had shared. And with the Florida Department of Transportation, when Hurricane Ian came through, Hurricane Ian was devastating in the area of Sanibel Island. As we know, it was destructive to the Sanibel Island Bridge, and FDOT did respond with all of its resources immediately. We worked across many jurisdictions and partnerships to, to bring the right type of response. Yeah, we don't know I think everyone knows that following the hurricane, we weren't able to get any emergency access over to the island um, because of the destruction to the bridge that happened. That was a three mile long section that was, that was destroyed. Um, we were able to react quickly. We were able to restore that access to those uh, emergency responders within 15 days, one week ahead of schedule, and very proud of that. But I think the thing that a lot of us can connect to, that's providing a lot of access, but the impacts on all of those families are things that you're gonna remember. Um, a story was shared with me where a family actually had lost connections with each other, and um, one of our district secretaries reunited that husband and that wife. And so these are the stories that I think are important to know, but we've got a lot of lessons to learn from them, and I think that's what you guys are going to talk about. Right. Yes, uh, the CHNEP area was unfortunately in the epicenter of Hurricane Ian and it impacted many of the cities and counties that we serve. It was the third costliest disaster in US history. Uh, it was such a large storm, it impacted multiple counties. Uh, we had flooding both from the storm surge but also then days after from inland rain that was working its way out to the coast. So, yeah, a lot of things that we saw that we had never seen before. Uh, the Peace River rose by 19 feet, the highest ever recorded. Uh, it was unprecedented in the amount of dis destruction, really, um, the amount of debris that was put out into our waterways, um, and you know, unbelievable loss of property, loss of even human life, and so it was very traumatic for many of our communities. In the days that followed CHNEP immediately, as soon as we could get uh, communication, uh, which was a challenge, uh, we were trying to reach out and coordinate with our members, figuring out where we could launch a boat. Um, we were essentially made aware that there were a lot of concerns about water quality and people were having to wade through flawed waters and they were traveling out to the barrier islands and there were reports of illnesses and rashes and no one was really prepared to do that emergency event sampling, but we were able um, through cooperation with all the different state and, and local governments uh, to cobble together the resources. And we even worked with universities, including University of Florida, who came in from outside the area, bringing boats and people to do emergency sampling and to get that information in the hands of policymakers to advise people uh, where there were hot spots of bacteria that were too numerous to count. Um, it was, you know, important information. We've learned a lot in the past year in the recovery effort. That was the immediate recovery efforts, but then, of course, we've transitioned now into long-term recovery and reflection. And certainly, where I live, right off of Charlotte Harbor, we were warned of an 18-foot storm surge, and there's nothing built uh, to the standards to withstand that type of storm surge. Um, we you know, have had wind events, we've had small surge events, but we've never had storm surge on the scale what hit Sanibel and Fort Myers Beach. So it has really shaped our thinking about what we need to do to be more resilient in the future. And um, we basically have come away with a couple key lessons learned, which is just that changes are happening faster than we predicted. We had done a lot of climate change modeling, looking at 
how islands, barrier islands, would be changed over time uh, due to sea level rise. We saw more changes to those islands in one day from Hurricane Ian than were predicted for 30, 40 years out. So I think that really made us think, OK, this isn't going to be this slow, linear progression. This could be you know, big bumps of changes. Uh, it affected our habitats. We saw, again, not only enormous marine debris, but that marine debris immediately started impacting wildlife. We had um, FWC researchers telling us that the bungees that are used to hold boat um, canopies on that all flung off into the canals, and now they are routinely finding small two sawfish that are being strangled because it slips over their head and they can't dislodge it. And um, apparently there's just thousands and thousands of these, and, and so it's become a routine occurrence to find marine life that are entangled in these. And, and then there are mangrove die-offs and freshwater ponds and wetlands that have permanently vegetative loss uh, and changes because of the saltwater intrusion killed off the freshwater vegetation. So we are, you know, really changing our thinking about how these types of events can impact our communities and our habitats and environmental resources and what we need to do to hopefully build more resilient communities and ecosystems in the future. Thanks, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And, and Frank, is there anything you want to add from? Yeah, the I, you know, I think that you know, Hurricane Ur, uh, Ian was so large and and dramatic, and the impacts there were statewide impacts or regional impacts. Um, what I got to see was the local impact. Um, we had areas in Altamont Springs that had 24 inches of, of rain over a 14-hour uh, period. We had residents who flooded. Their homes were in a floodplain. They'd never flooded because we'd never had that much rain. The Little Wakaiva River flows through the city of Altamont Springs. So they're standing in five feet of water, can't believe this occurred, and are looking at us. What are you going to do to fix my house? How are you going to get the water out of here? Why didn't you build a retention pond at the end of the street for the 612 cubic feet per second of water that was flowing through the waterway? And there are many lessons learned. I mean, one of them is empathy. Um, we're still not back into my house on the St. John's. And um, uh, a couple of days after the storm, I was at the city. Uh, I said, hey, I've got to go to my house. I have cats there. I don't. My wife does. If you like cats, we're probably <laughs> not going to get along well. But you know, I love my wife. But I, I went out to look at the house, and there were, you know, we had about four or five feet of, of freeboard space between where the water was and the edge of our house. By the next day, we had 10 inches of water in it because we know the water, watershed in the Indian River Lagoon, it comes up into the St. John's. We knew the water was going to stage up and it was gonna stage up late. The, the trauma of watching your floor flow down the St. John's though, helps you have a, a little bit more empathy for the people who simply are asking questions that all of us in this room know. It, it are completely ridiculous questions, but in the, in the heat of the moment with all of that emotion that is filled up within them, ha taking a moment and understanding they just are not processing the gravity of it. So having been a victim of the flood itself, it, it has helped us a little bit with our response. But one of the, one of the many lessons learned is that um, one of them we already know, Father Time and Mother Nature undefeated. They're gonna always win. And there's no way to prepare for a hurricane like that. What we learned was that what we have to communicate to residents and what we all need to be able to communicate statewide um, ha is different. The magnitude of the storms are different. The intensity of the storms are different. Uh, the amount of damage and the inability to get insurance to cover it all has put people in a very different position. So the things that we're trying to, trying to learn to communicate better is, um, is to why you have to trust the information you're getting from your government. We are telling you it's coming. We are telling you you are in a place where you could be impacted. And we're living in a time in the United States where government's not as trusted as it needs to be. And we have to fight through that and make sure that people understand 
Sandbagging's not gonna work. Get, making sure you have all of your materials. It's really important to make sure you have ice for your insulin, that kind of stuff. And those are things that we have been, we, we've really had to learn how to do, but now we're a year later. And there are very hot summer, and there are algae blooms in some naturally occurring lakes. And our residents just can't understand why we are not treating that like a residential amenity. Why we're not out there blasting it with aqua, with, with herbicides and killing the fish. They just can't understand that because what they know is that a year ago it looked beautiful and now it doesn't. So I think among the lessons learned, I think we all really need to embrace state, regional, um, through, through specific district types of things is how do we communicate in, a, in an authentic way that residents are going to accept? A, we kind of know what we're talking about, and, and, but second, how do we answer the question that is really inside of them that makes them very mistrustful of, of the service and response that they do get from government? And I think that's been a hard lesson for all of us to get our hands around. All right. And, well, and thank you all for that, but you know, I want to come back, not just from the lessons learned, but eventually to talk about what solutions and, and practices you guys are taking moving forward. Uh, but before we get to that point, I want to talk about one of the other great themes of this, which is the economics of it all. And um, so I wanted to pose to you and, and ask, you know, what economic studies and work or communication have you been involved in trying to value the area that you are that you have here in Florida. So I know, Jennifer, you and I talked a little bit about this, if you'd like to field. Yes, uh, we actually at the CHNEP, on behalf of the whole partnership, hired the Balmoral Group, who I know is here as well today, um, back in 2020 to do an economic valuation study. And this is different than payment for ecosystem services, which I know has also been talked about at this conference. This is really looking at hard data of what revenue generation is already happening tied to natural resources, trying to quantify that and relay that to policymakers so that they can consider that when they're investing, continuing to maintain or restore those resources, what kind of return on investment can they expect for making those investments? So um, the study that we did was for the whole CHNEP area, and it is also broken out by county and by basin, if you go on our website um, to read it. But looking at the whole study area, we looked at recreational expenditures. Uh, they came to about $11 billion a year of recreation that's directly tied to natural resources. Agricultural production, no surprise, $2.5 billion a year, a very large amount tied to natural resources. Uh, commercial fishing, 25.9 million a year. They actually looked at real estate values and quantified the amount, uh, you know, essentially if you live close to a waterway or close to conservation lands, that's an amenity that increases your real estate value and they were able to quantify that amount of added real estate value and that was 381 million a year. And without going on and on, I mean, the total economic benefits were over $14 billion a year that are already currently being enjoyed based on the natural resource assets we have in our community. So it really shows you what's at stake uh, if these resources aren't properly maintained, if we have waterways that become more degraded or we lose environmentally sensitive lands that are providing us great benefit right now. So. Um, the last thing I would mention is we also looked at certain large-scale proposed restoration projects like the C-43 Reservoir Project along the Kusachi River and what the 10-year costs would be for those projects and then what were the actual economic benefits um, that would be gleaned over that same 10-year period and calculated what that return on investment would be for those projects and brought that information back to policymakers. Um, so that they could see that they were going to recover essentially that investment in the form of these direct economic revenue um, benefits. But I think the other thing is that those benefits, of course, extend well beyond 10 years. So, you know, you would recoup all your investment in 10 years, and yet you would still have benefits far beyond that. So, this kind of information really highlights what our panel 
you know, is talking about today, that there is this direct relationship between our environment and our economy, and that these investments in protecting these resources absolutely benefits all these various industries that, that we rely upon and that employ and benefit Floridians and, and tourists that come to our state. Absolutely. And, and Kim? What I was going to add to that is how we can reduce future costs. And through um, a federal grants program, so it's the PROTECT, the state of Florida is receiving $70 million, and that money is being directed to resilience projects. There's also a competitive grant portion to that, that the state is working to capitalize on those opportunities. In addition, the Department of Transportation is putting together a resilience improvement plan. That's actually an optional report for state DOTs and also MPOs, and it addresses the state transportation system resilience of current and also future weather events. So once that document's approved by FHWA, that, that resilience improvement plan, it can actually reduce the non-federal cost share for projects that are funded by PROTECT by up to 10%, which is great. So when finalized, all eligible benefiting communities requesting those PROTECT grant funds will be, a reward, will be awarded a reduction in the, in the cost share. Okay. Well, um, from there, I wanted to give you guys a chance to talk a little bit more about some of the things you've done to be more resilient, and, and not just in the environmental sector, but for our infrastructure, for our energy use, and things like that. Um, looking forward, what have, what have your organizations done? And um, Frank, I want to go ahead and start with you. Sure, sure. We, um, it, environmental innovation has been part of what our city has been doing for decades. Uh, our city built the first dual water, wastewater uh, facility in the Southeast United States in the middle 80s. And we've been doing reclaimed water, you know, back when people were going nuts that you're putting purple pipes in the ground. And, and really, it was a very forward-thinking uh, concept uh, and its time. Um, but what, you know, kind of has hit us is marrying together how do you uh, ensure some business resiliency, your community's resiliency. Um, and we've attacked it in a couple of different ways. Um, the first is we built um, uh, the only one of the only one in Florida, but one of three floating solar arrays that produce one megawatt of uh, solar electricity. We use it to power our water wastewater plant. So for about seven, so for a sunny day, we can do about 70% of our plant is run by solar. It formed the basis for a new law in Florida uh, relating to photo, uh, photovoltaics. And having some uh, supplemental and sustainable energy sources just in case our plant loses power, um, the trickle, the, the domino effect of having a sewer plant go bad or having a lift station go bad during a storm is really significant. You know, you understand the biologics uh, of it all, but, but the importance of actually focusing on the things that are impacting communities like making sure that there are generators at the lift stations, making sure that there are, are flood mitigation or flooding mitigation um, types of barriers around those lift stations. It's a lot of little stuff, but they really add up to your ability to be resilient and being able to get people back into their jobs. Uh, Altamont Springs is known, believe it or not, this is absolutely true. We were ranked the number one worst city in Central Florida uh, to get a building permit from. We were the hardest to deal with. And it's because we make the stormwater engineers do their calculations. We check their math. And if it takes an extra month, we don't really care. It's got to be right. The flip side of it, we were ranked the 19th best city in the, in the United States for small business. And it is because we get it right, we get it right the first time, and then we focus on how do we make sure these people do well. That, we, we, I, I tell my staff all the time, we don't get paid till they get paid. So let's make sure they get paid. And among the things we do is we, we do a lot of little stuff, the resiliency work. We make sure that not only the electric connections are safe, but we also make sure that our sewer, sewer lines are maintained, our stormwater inlets are maintained. We have great in code enforcement. Everybody hates code enforcement until it's your neighbor. And then they're your best friends. 
Hey, my neighbors won't mow their grass have a green pool. Code enforcement is huge because most developers, if you, most developers do a great job, they get a, a, something on the ground. 15 years later, the new tenant of that is not maintaining that stormwater pond. So it's not perking any longer and it's not working. And then there's a, a microburst and suddenly you have water flowing in places you've never had it before. So we have been focusing on how do we make sure that we do a lot of the little things at the same time doing the macro things with the solar array and some of the other um, um, really large infrastructure projects that we're involved in. But, but I encourage all of you, um, when you see a code enforcement person that's in your neighborhood, what they're really doing is trying to make sure that what, what is around you is compliant with a code, and those codes are what help us make Florida and our local communities resilient after the fact. Well, and thank you for that. And I, I wanted to make sure, too, that we had a chance to talk to Kim and Jennifer about the mixture of that gray and green infrastructure, the built environment, the natural environment, and what nature-based solutions are being put in place or being thought of for the future uh, of our state and the programs you work with. So. You want to go first. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that the gray infrastructure examples you just mentioned are absolutely top of mind for many of the cities and counties in our area as well. I think we learned um, a lot of things with lift stations, uh, losing power, failing, um, different types of infrastructure upgrades that are needed on top of the routine mm -hmm. to better prepare for future extreme weather and storm events. But we also are trying to really look at everything through the lens of are there nature-based solutions that also can be blended together with these you know, traditional infrastructure improvements. And we have a couple projects that we are working on. One is really a perfect example of the power of partnerships, which I know we've talked about at this conference already. Um, but it was a project that originated with a business owner in Puna Gorda who owned the Four Point Sheridan, who was very interested in an article about an oyster restoration project that we had done and reached out to us and uh, also uh, worked with the Nature Conservancy uh, and our local government, which was the city of Puna Gorda. We then reached out to DEP. They became a partner, and then we, representing the federal government, were also involved. And we were able to design a living shoreline to go on this outer perimeter of the city. City of Punta Gorda, if you're not familiar with it, it's a peninsula of sorts, a little point, it means fat point, sticks out into Charlotte Harbor. Very vulnerable, low-lying, highest FEMA risk category there is. So the idea is not to remove the existing seawall, but to build a buffer in front of it that would buffer it from wave action, try to soften or absorb some storm surge, provide an additional layer of protection along the coastline of this, of this beautiful uh, historic coastal city. So you know we have gone forward already with this partnership and we've been able, through us all cobbling together our resources, our staff, our money, we have been able to get enough resources to now construct this. And it's very exciting because it's going to be um, a prototype for our area where other communities can come and see what can be done to happen, to build a strengthened shoreline, but also a softer shoreline that provides aquatic habitat. It'll have mangroves, it'll have oysters, it'll have fish habitat. So it really is a, a beautiful way to provide more protection to our communities while enhancing our natural resources at the same time. And that's really what we're trying to do now is really explore how to partner with local governments to um, figure out ways to accomplish multiple objectives. Sometimes if we're coming at it one way, we're only fixing one problem, but we may not be fixing another or we may be worsening another. So we're, right. we're now looking at these new green-gray infrastructure projects. And then the last thing I would mention is that 
A lot of our communities in our area have not fully identified all the vulnerabilities and risks in their community uh, that would be impacted by climate change factors. So this extreme rainfall that you mentioned, it's something I think now everyone's starting to realize, oh wow, there's these rain bombs mm -hmm. that come down that completely overwhelm our stormwater systems. And how do we plan for that? Um, so I think one of the things that we're doing in partnership with the state of Florida through the Resilient Florida program is funding each of these 10 counties to do those comprehensive vulnerability assessments to really identify and address those vulnerabilities and risks on a community by community basis. Great, thank you. Hmm. Kim, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I wanna give you a chance to answer and then maybe quickly talk about our hopes for the future of a resilient Florida and economy. I, I think what I was gonna add is I would love to give a plug and I have an ask for the audience. So the state of Florida is actually competing against 12 other states for a national award. It's through AASHTO, and it's the America's Transportation Award. It is the greatest example of resiliency, and it has to do with FDOT's response to the Sanibel Island Bridge. Would love to be recognized on that national stage. I would encourage you to go and vote. You can vote daily from each of your different devices. If you're not quite sure where to go, um, I've got a link on my LinkedIn, and I've actually reposted a post that Katie Sherrard did. She did a phenomenal job leading the department's effort in that recovery. You can also go to the americastransportationawards.org, and we'd love to have you support the department. That's awesome. Thanks. Well, we only have a few seconds left, but I, I wanted to Thank all three of you for your input and, and being a part of this panel and providing your perspectives from various backgrounds and organizations on planning for the future in Florida. Um, I know there's plenty of conversations we still need to have. There are other sectors where rising seas and increasing temperatures and rainfall are gonna be really impacted and, and that will affect the economy of the entire state. So, I would just say, stay engaged in the conversation, think about the future uh, like everyone here is, and um, we'll continue to do great things together. So thank you all, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you.